What is the beast's name? The character's name is Adam. And that's debatable. <laughs> A lot of people don't agree with that. We won't get into that. How are you guys? Good. We're, We're having good. a good time. Yes. Amazing. This is such an honor. Thank you guys so much for being here for the inaugural Animate right here in Raleigh. Uh, have you guys had any time to explore the city this weekend, or you guys have been kept pretty busy? There's a city here? <laughs> no, I, I don't mean that as an insult. It's just that we haven't had a chance to see any of it. We've yeah. been we, yeah, absolutely we've, ensconced here. We've been busy, but we love the hotel and we love the people. That's yes. great. Amazing people. You guys are incredible. Uh, so I, I wanted to start by asking you guys, I know both of you guys, in addition to doing, obviously, the wonderful Beauty and the Beast, you also did live stage productions as well. Did you guys ever work together in any live theater productions? <laughs> yes, as a matter yeah. of fact, we did. A lot, we, actually. We had actually done uh, quite a bit of stage work bef before uh, we did Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, so uh, we were old friends before we did this, so I could pick on him a lot easier, because <laughs> I knew him when I... <laughs> We actually went to Egypt, the uh, Cairo Opera House. we went to Cairo. We opened the Opera House in Cairo, the new Opera House. So. Yeah, with Showboat back in 89, was it? 88, 89? Yeah, I, I can't I was, remember. Uh, but, yeah. I would have been much too young to have done it. <laughs> <United States, so. laughs> we had a great time. Yeah, was the, the president at that time had an American wife, and she said, I want an American musical, blah, blah, blah. So we went over, and we had a blast. Yes, we I Actually, I, I just met my husband, and... The first date, I asked him on out on a date to go to Cairo with me, and he turned me down. <laughs> now, over 33 years later, he said, why did I turn you down for that trip? <clears throat> yeah, that's like very serendipitous that you knew each other before. <laughs> and so do you feel like knowing each other from doing the shows that it helped with your relationship of Belle and Gaston when you were oh, recording? Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I think so. Yes, uh, notoriously, <laughs> uh, Disney... Um, would always work with the, uh, the voice actors uh, separately. And you rarely would interact with one another during the recording process. And, and in our show, that wasn't necessarily the case. Uh, Paige felt strongly that she wanted to work to face the actors to whom she was speaking uh, and the characters that, that uh, she would be with. So uh, we got to do a lot more of that. And I think that that did help to inform uh, a lot of uh, of, of, of the finished product and, and the relationships between the characters. I was the, the naughty film. one that, <laughs> that they didn't want to do that because it takes a lot more time and it's a lot more expensive. So now all the people f you know, after me said, thank you for doing that because now we all get to interact with each other. But truthfully, I think the directors even said so too, that the scenes are better that way. Well, they are. I mean, <clears throat> I, mean uh, I, I understand. It gives them more control, of course, uh, if they can edit everything in together. Uh, whereas if you have two actors facing one another, then they have control over how they're going to react to one another. And so it, 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 I think from our perspective, that's a big plus, but, but for a producer's uh, perspective, you know, it, it, it's a little more difficult perhaps to get exactly what they had in mind the first time. So, so what was the atmosphere like when you were recording? Did it feel magical? Like, for, for lack of a better word, it's just, I can't imagine the the process of getting to film something so iconic. You know, it was interesting. With Beauty and the Beast, people don't realize it took four years to make the movie. And uh, we were on it for just a little over two. Mm -hmm. We would record for a while, and then we'd go off and do our plays or whatever, and they'd animate. And they would actually animate to us. They would, they would have the film rolling all day long while we were recording so they could copy. You know, they're, they're actors with pencils. I mean, they, they all the little nuances and stuff, they would copy from us. and. Uh, but it was, I think the, the most magic really came from Howard. You know, oh, Howard yeah, yeah. Ashman, Beauty and the Beast was his vision. And he was such a charismatic genius um, that you're either totally intimidated or you just like would bite the bullet and just go for the ride, you know, and enjoy the ride. And that's what we did. We just, we, everybody in the cast was like that. The, um, the directors, the writers, the artists all followed his vision. And I think that's why the movie was so cohesive and so good, because it was all Howard's vision. Yeah. Don Hahn, who um, produced our film, also produced a documentary uh, about Howard. Yes, if you and haven't seen it, definitely you, there are, look, at, look at it. There are certain uh, uh, 
one, one part of that is, is our participation in, in Beauty and the Beast, and you get to see a little bit of how he interacted with actors and, and uh, with all of the other people uh, in, involved. He sort of, uh, he was a very big personality. And he was. He, 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 he sprinkled was. it uh, graciously and, and generously <laughs> on everybody, so uh, it, it bears his stamp. But, but the actual doing of it, from my perspective, was just fun. Yes, it I mean, was. You it just was fun. never realize how much fun you could have because you, yeah. you, you're in a booth and there's a light here and there's a, a, a your script is, is here and there are people over there who are, you know, encouraging in various ways or, or helping to make suggestions or to direct. They call it directing. <laughs> but, um, uh, you then you get to play. Uh, other actors have said that uh, the best way to describe that booth it's an it's an actor's sandbox. You you you're it turned really turned loose to 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 do anything. And, yeah. and when you're doing an animated film, th one of the differences between doing a live action thing and a, a an animated thing is is that live action guys are, are tied to gravity. In in animation, there's no gravity. <laughs> You, if you imagine something flying up or going over or, or whatever, whatever you can imagine, they can draw. Whereas in real life, you have to, <laughs> your feet have to stay on the ground. So it, it's, it's very freeing in a way. Robin uh, Williams took that to another level. <laughs> yes, he certainly he did. Really did didn't he really did. He certainly did. Oh my gosh, what a lesson from him. But the animators just go nuts because they can do anything. And, and if you spend much time around them, uh, that's sort of how they communicate uh, in general with one another. You know, they quickly <laughs> scribble something down yeah. and hand it back and forth. And that, that's how they... It's true. Because it, it's, it's a freer way to express yourself. And, and they, make, uh, they make hay of that. Also, an interesting statistic is that each animator would spend an entire week to draw five seconds of film. I used to say 20 seconds and I was corrected by Mark Henn. Five seconds of film for a week, yeah. Well worth it, obviously. <laughs> and I just, I, I feel like this period in, in Disney animation like was the renaissance. It was just so perfect, so beautiful. I wanna know, what, what, is, what does it feel like to you to be part of this period of the Disney renaissance and this gorgeous animation? Well. Well, I, 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 to go back to yeah. what Paige was saying before, yeah. you know, Howard really, uh, I think, is responsible for that. Uh, well, the Little and, Mermaid he and would be, Alan, yep. he and Alan Menken. They, uh, they actually put their own money into it and begged Disney to do yeah. Little Mermaid, I mean, it, they, and they talked them into it. Howard brought this concept of, of having stage actors, you know, uh, Broadway-type uh, actors who, who sang and, uh, and acted, uh, to do both the, the dialogue and the, the music uh, to, to make it more um, cohesive uh, in that way. And uh, Alan brought in Alan Menken's music. I mean, my Lord, Alan has done so many, is responsible for so many of the pieces that you're talking about, uh, this renaissance. It, at that time, too, animation was considered dead. I mean, they, nobody would touch it. And it was really Howard, with like a dog with a bone, he would not stop at Michael Eisner. And I mean, they went after Michael every day in and day out trying to convince him. Michael finally said, I'm going, if you, you shut up, we'll do Little Mermaid. <laughs> but you know, you think about it, had he not been like that and Little Mermaid had not have happened, think of all of these it's movies. Not, none of them would. It, it would had not happened. been so successful. Yeah. No, I don't want to yeah. think about that. I know, I know. I know. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's astounding, actually. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about your art as well. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, you, you mentioned you're, you're signed to, what, what is it? Yeah, Disney? I'm signed with Disney Fine Art as an artist now, and um, it's really kind of wonderful, like full circle, because when I was, I've always drawn and painted watercolors since I was a little girl. Same time I started acting classes, and I used to paint a watercolor for my acting teacher once a week, because she was very tough on me. And at nine years old, you know, I just like trying to win her over. But I, when I went to New York at 17, I would paint my watercolors and sell them on the street and help pay my rent. And I've always just painted for fun. And then when Beauty and the Beast came out, I was painting a few bells for my friends and family. And uh, my husband said, Paige, you know, let's, why don't we see if they're interested in your work? My husband actually made it happen. But um, Michael Young, I went to an event that was a... a uh, Gonzalez, R R was it good? no, it was Rodell, Rodell that night. Rodell was doing Beauty and the Beast, and he said, do you want to just be there as Belle and Paige and whatever? And he said, bring one of your paintings, and Michael 
brought one of my Bell by Bells, and that night, Disney Fine Arts signed me. And that was about 13 years ago. So, so I, paint, I paint Beauty and the Beast, but I also paint all the princesses, and I paint Lion King, and you know, it's all fun. And any Gastons? Yes, actually, I told him the first. <laughs> You, he, you told me you wanted that painting. I do, and I've not seen it. Where is it? <laughs> it's sold in two days. Literally, the one with I Gaston, so the Positivity Primeval. That's the one that's sold, like in two days. I'll paint you another one, Richard. See, I, I, I love... <laughs> thank you. I, I, I love when we do things like this, and she says this in front of an audience. <laughs> it's important that, that we be able to go back and say, right. you told them. I will paint you a Gaston, I thank promise. You, dear. <laughs> That's incredible. So we're going to so, go to some questions from the crowd. What's your name? What's your question? I'm Nick, and I was wondering, besides Beauty and the Beast, what is your favorite Disney film? Well, my favorite film of all time happens to be Disney, and it's Mary Poppins. <laughs> yeah. And I was so blessed to have met and spent the weekend with Julie Andrews at Disney World. She was, uh, we were at an event and I was so nervous to meet her. And I mean, that's a whole long story, another hour to take, but, <laughs> but she was so gracious and she said, oh, you know, I'm here by myself. Would you and Michael like to you know, come with me? And we got to be buddies. And that was, that was like, you know, <laughs> royalty and she's as wonderful as you can imagine so mine's Mary Poppins what about you Richard honestly I, I, I the truth is it's, it's Snow White Not, maybe that's because that's the my o era <laughs> uh, the original the OG but, but you know just, just seeing the, the animals and how they moved and, and how you know all of a sudden uh, I was just the right age for it and uh, I, I've never gotten over it so that's my favorite. All right, thank you. What's your name? Hi, I'm Ashlyn. Um, I am a musical theater major, and I was wondering what did the vocal training look like in preparation for all of the music in the movie? Um, it's interesting. They, <laughs> we were both accomplished in theater, obviously, in Broadway at that time, and um, they wanted Broadway actors. Mm -hmm. but. They wanted me to use my own voice, and I thought when I was auditioning, I, I was using my own voice, but when I got to the studio, I was always thinking all of a sudden, you know, I, I think I sound, in my 30s, I don't sound 20, because Belle is supposed to be 20. She's the only one that's not a teenager. And I started raising my voice, and Howard's like, cut, cut, stop, stop. We don't want that voice, we want your voice. And so it was the closest I've ever, the closest role to Paige that I've ever played. So it was really one of those things I just had to let my nerves you know, go away and just be myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was what it was. It was pretty lucky for me, actually. I, my, my experience was <coughs> very similar and very different. Um, in talking to Howard and, and, and to various people and, and to Alan, you know, what, what they wanted uh, Gaston to be like, they, they, somewhere somebody said, you know, well, nobody sings like Gaston. And so, I was free to just sing, <laughs> like Gaston. But Richard, can, <laughs> he can fill an opera house without a mic. He really can. I mean, that voice is She's Richard's. saying that I have a big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> well, we didn't have microphones at the opera house in Cairo. Remember, they were on the yes, floor. I we do. didn't have any microphones. That was kind of cool. <laughs> Good question. Do you remember the first songs that you heard from the film? Well, that's what I was going to say. The, oh, the other yeah. part of that, that question yeah. uh, is, is that uh, I, I can remember uh, very, very early on uh, being gathered around a piano with Howard singing, he, with Alan yes. and Howard there, uh, singing their songs to us to give us an idea yes. what they sounded like and, uh, and so forth. So from the very beginning, I, I, think, uh, I think each of us had a real good idea of, of what they wanted uh, from these characters. And yeah, so that made the, it very easy for us. Was we it the Bell song that you heard first or Gaston song? I heard a Gaston song first, yeah. but yeah. Uh, yeah. So, good question. Go ahead, what's your name? Ethan. Uh, it's been kind of touched upon, but uh, do you, either of you have anything further to add with what working with Howard was like? Oh man, you know, it's, it's hard enough to get emotional when you talk about Howard Ashman. Howard was ill at the time. Yeah, he was. Uh, well, he didn't tell us that he was sick. We didn't know because he had more energy than anyone. 
I mean, it was unbelievable. And then we found out later how sick he had been. And um, it was just one of those people that you're lucky if you meet one in a lifetime that has such an imagination and that is so creative and so inspiring. Um, he inspired Beauty and the Beast. I, that's the only way I can put it. You know, it's, uh, it was, and, and Don Hahn, I mean, talks about it when he, they finally, you know, he's producing it. He said, you just gave him carte blanche. And if anybody strayed from that idea, we'd always go back to Howard's. Only one idea that Howard lost, lost on. Um, the opening number, Alan Menken wanted that seven minute number. And Howard said, absolutely not, it will well, never work. seven minutes is ridiculous. Yeah, it will never it's, work, it will never work. It's just too long, you can't you know? possibly make it work. And Alan said, well, they do it in operettas all the time, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, the powers that be said, in this case, Howard, you're wrong. We love the bell song just as it's written. So that was the only thing that he, and he agreed later. The other, other thing that, that Howard was disappointed in, which is just a t little trivia, Human Again was his favorite song which ended up in the Broadway play and in the version that was the extra long version they did for the second release, is that right? Third release? On the DVD. On yeah. the DVD, yeah. No, but Human Again was his favorite song and if you think about the lyric and what he was going through. But that's also one of the ones that he sang to us around the piano with, with, with Alan. Yeah, you're right. That, he and, did. And that, that was cut from the initial, yeah. from the initial uh, release yeah. uh, because it doesn't further um, the action, rather, it, it, it describes what he thinks about things. And then when it was then put back in later on, I think those of us who knew yeah. the number were very glad to see it. But and then uh, when we found out what, that he was dying, I yes. thought the lyric was him writing about himself. We miss him. What's your name? Kimberly. I'm curious, can you still quote something from the movie? Well, I always say my favorite one, you've heard it. Gaston, you're positively primeval. I know. <laughs> bell? You have a big bell voice. No. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we, we, we can and we sometimes do. But uh, I, I, I don't really put it together anymore uh, like, like it is in the film it, where it... I, I can I take lines. Well, some people use their imagination. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm razzing him. I'm razzing him. Uh, I, I was just asked to to do Gaston again. Uh, well, uh, in uh, the um, the Castle Quest, I think they're called. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and uh, I was very pleased that uh, they agreed that he still sounded like Gaston. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> I watched that. You were good in it. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. Uh, but so, yes, I, uh, I can still do those things, but uh, generally don't. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate you trying anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm sure enough people come up and quote it to you guys all day long anyway. You well, there's that. It <laughs> it's wonderful. I love to hear people do that. Good. What's your name? My name is Julia. Hi, Julia. What's your question? Um, what is the beast's name? The actor's Robbie Benson. Adam. <laughs> and Robbie is now a, re a running character on Severance, the TV show. So he's very excited to be back in front of the camera again. Well, yeah, he was, yeah. he was cast and then there was COVID and then there was uh, an actor's strike and so he's been on hold for a while yeah. and he's very happy to be doing Robbie's that. Robbie's one of those people, he, he directs, he writes, he acts, he sings, he writes music. I mean, he's unbelievably talented. And during the pandemic, he and Carla, his wife, about every two weeks would send us a new song they'd written. And they put some animation to it. It was really cool. So. But the character's name is Adam. And that's debatable. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people don't agree with that. Well, we won't get into oh. that. Anyway. Great question. Thank you so much. Hi, what's your name? Add a girl. <laughs> Good girl. My name's Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Um, and what's y'all's favorite song in the movie? In the in the movie? Well, that's why Gaston, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's hard. My favorite song isn't mine. It's the, the title song, Beauty and the Beast. But I I also love something there a lot. Mm -hmm. Something there was the last song that Howard wrote. 
and uh, that's the last time I got to talk with him when we were recording and he was on the phone from the hospital and giving me direction and stuff like that. And I was very fortunate. Angela did not want to do the, the press events. And so Angela Lansbury asked me if I would do this, go out and sing her song for the press. So it was really cool. Well, it was very fun. Oh, but that, uh, on the, what was it, the, that anniversary thing that we did where oh, she yes. came out and sang? In fact, you can still see uh, uh, Angela sing In her sing 90s, that. singing the song. Uh, and and, and that afternoon, she was saying, Paige, uh, I don't know. know what to do. Alan plays it way too slow. I can't sing it that slow. And I said, trust me, Angela, he'll follow you. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, she's Angela Lansbury. I mean, come on. But it's a of course, Alan's going to follow her. It's a wonderful performance if yeah, you it haven't is. seen it. it it's, it's kind of an acting class, when you, a master class when you see it. Yeah. Great question. That's a great question. What's your name? Hi, uh, my name's Connor, and this is a question for Richard. Um, as a voice actor, what goes through your head when you start preparing for the role of a villain? See, there's that word. <laughs> <laughs> villain. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Let me ask, answer your question first. Um, I, I, we were talking about this a little bit, uh, the idea of being a voice actor. I don't think any of us thinks of ourselves as voice actors. That's not really primarily what our careers have, have been, although this is probably the most visible thing uh, that I've ever done, and I'm, I yeah. imagine that, that yes. Paige has ever done. Um, it, it's really only one show among a lifetime of shows and characters that, that we've been. So I don't think we have a, a, um, a specific method of preparing a voice acting uh, job. We think of it as, as an acting job. Um, what is the character? What do they want? What do they need? What, what is their dilemma at any given moment? And once you understand those things about your character, then you can start to look at the words and how do the words uh, help you with that. And once you have done that, then you can start imagining a performance uh, and, and going from there. But that's true of any, uh, any role that an actor uh, takes on. So I don't really think it's different. Maybe musicals are a little bit different because they have uh, additional um, uh, challenges uh, for an actor because you've, somehow you've got to sing the high note whether you, you, know <laughs> whether you yeah. feel like it or not. Uh, so, um, but you also brought the villain to be a comical villain. Well, that, that's, that I, was I, you. I think. That was you. That was Richard being I, funny. I do think that, that uh, Gaston is, is, um, is unique. I think that any uh, character is unique. But uh, to, to generalize as a villain, we'll, we'll get to the, that later. Uh, <laughs> but um, you, I don't think that it's, it serves um, the actor or the piece to, to think of him as a villain. Uh, he's a character, and uh, he knows what he wants, and he, boy, from his point of view, uh, he's, he's a savior uh, <laughs> to these people, and uh, he's going to protect them from a beast. And, he's still uh, in denial. He thinks that Gaston's not dead. He's like, he's like, she's he still thinks thinking he's about Cairo and denial. <laughs> being <laughs> died. No, uh, but you know, when you really think of it from that point of view, you begin to understand how Gaston is really a tragic hero. <laughs> He's trying to save people, and they just don't understand. That, that's, we'll, we'll go into that another time, but I hope that helps you to understand our process a little bit. Thank you so much. <laughs> sure. What's your name? Hi, uh, my name's Emery, and I was just wondering what y'all's favorite uh, stage, like live stage production was? or is? The one that we've been in, or one that we've seen? The one that you've been in. Oh man, that's hard. It's really that's hard. hard. <laughs> Again, and for, for me, one of the reasons it's hard is, is that each character that you take on it becomes the Your most favorite. important one yeah, uh, at that time, true. and you've got to find what it is you love about that character. Now, with Gaston, it's easy to know what to love. <laughs> In <laughs> some other characters, it might be a little more challenging. But, but that I'm ser to be serious about it, you, you really must find that uh, in yourself and in, in the character in order to move on. So you love them all. I, that said, to, to do um, Man of La Mancha is, is, is very special. Um, uh, Maury Yeston and, and Arthur Copet wrote a phantom. Oh, I saw him in was this phantom of the special. opera. I didn't even recognize Richard. He was so different in this role. Acting chops were <laughs> off the charts. It was so good. He wears nine masks. <laughs> That's why she didn't recognize no, him. It was, it, it was amazing to see him do that one. 
Thank that was you. cool. Thank you. It, but it, that is a that is a lovely recording of it on, on RCA. But uh, yeah, that one and 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 any chance you get to do La Mancha for for me uh, is is wonderful. But uh, we we met uh, doing uh, Showboat and and Ravenal is is just so much fun. And some people think of him as a villain too, I know, just because he's a do. gambler and leaves his family and yeah. his, his his young <laughs> young daughter. But. But he makes the full turnaround, <laughs> yeah. For me, I can't really pick it. I mean, I really had a blast. There was a time in my life when I really was having fun was Drood, when I got to play Edwin Drood. Um, Robbie Marshall had picked me to do the national tour. I'd, I'd stood by for the role on Broadway um, for Donna Murphy. And then I went on quite a bit because Donna had other projects. And so I, I was a kind of a regular, <laughs> like a couple times a week playing Edwin. But playing the British boy was really fun. And uh, I did the national tour, and it was great. But Speaking I also of acting, playing a British boy. I know you know that my agent wouldn't even submit me for the part, and I almost left Jim for that. He said, "I just can't see you doing it." And so I just went on my own and got got this. And Rob Marshall coached me on it and said, "This is what you need to do." Blah 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 blah. And then you know my hands were the biggest problem because they're like little tiny hands. But he would have me carry weights around the living room with that, and we'd do stances, and we'd talk, and we'd breathe, and we'd do all this stuff. And he said, just for fun, it's okay if it doesn't work. Uh, the, the director actually said that, for fun, go out to a bar in drag and see if you could pull it off and ask for a, a drink. You can get arrested for that now. <laughs> so I did, and I got the wig on and the whole bit. Of course, I had a hat kind of, you know, and I asked for a Chardonnay. <laughs> and the, the bartender, afterwards I said, all right, okay. He started laughing. He said, I, did you buy that I was a boy? He said, actually, at first I did until you were giggling. And then <laughs> I kind of <laughs> gave it away. So oh, anyway, but it was great fun. I love that. Betty Buckley, the great Betty Buckley created that role. And it was a real challenge vocally because she had to belt high E's and stuff at the, at the very end of the show as high E. And, and then she got to be the actress who plays the, within the play. So the, the actress was this naughty, crazy actress. And so you had multiple roles you played, so that was fun. Yeah, all right, thank you. What's your name? My name is Cadence, and um, Belle, did you, um, did playing Belle change you as a, a person? Did playing Belle change you as a person? Oh my gosh, well it, ch it changed my life for sure, you know, it's uh, it's so different with theater, because theater you do these performances and they're gone. You know, sometimes you're lucky to have them recorded, but Bell lives on forever. You know, it's been 32 years, and um, all the people that she has affected in their lives, and the film has affected. People come up and tell me their stories, of what the film meant to to them, or Bell meant to them. That's that's the greatest gift of being able to be a part of that. This was also one of the first films that where it was all digital, so that when it came back, it was. Uh, it, it was preserved forever, yeah. and uh, so uh, that, that's a very special thing. I think we, mm -hmm. we all, when we went into it, were very much aware that this would be a legacy uh, for a very, very, very long time. Great question. Thank you. Um, so you both started with like stage acting and being able to use like your body language and your own facial expressions. How are you still able to bring the character to life with only being able to use your voice and having to go off of the animation? Aha, uh -huh, but, but, but that's not really how it works. Uh, as, as Paige said earlier, they film everything that you do. So as a result, um, when, you, when you do a session, there's a camera, more than one camera in, in some cases, uh, catching your every expression. Uh, they want to make sure that uh, when they are trying to draw to your voice, that they get exactly the emotion that, that you're trying. And one of the ways they do that is to look at your facial expression and what does your face do. And they oftentimes uh, make the, their animation copy what your face does or what body. what your body, your body is doing. Well, yeah. uh, and they're really good at that to the point that there would people who know me when they went to see the, the movie for the first time, said, oh my God, he, he looks exactly like you. People who don't know me go, he doesn't look a thing like you. How did it possibly? <laughs> but they, they see my expressions, right. expressions that, that only 
I do, in Gaston. And I know what they mean because the only other human being that I know of that when I look in the mirror, I, we, I, I see the same expressions, uh, is, is, is my daughter. Uh, she, and I, I, when I see those things and I look at, at Gaston, I go, okay, I know what they're talking about, but they, they really have, in, they're really, really good at that, uh, incorporating your performance. And that's, that, I think, is why they begin with the voice. Uh, they always put the voice down first and then draw to the voice. And if that's dissatisfying or not enough in some way or another, you know, then they will have you come back and re-record uh, certain things, which is one of the reasons that we worked on it for about two and a half years, uh, right, was the redoing. You. Yeah. All right, we have about 10 minutes left, so this should be the perfect <coughs> amount of questions. Go ahead, what's your name? My name's Catherine, this is for Mr. White. What was it like being recalled to reprise your role in Dreamlight Valley after all this time? Was it different than the original movie to be a video game? Was it easier, harder? Well, I, I've been called back a lot of times to do um, uh, a little bit uh, uh, here or a little bit there. You know, sometimes uh, they, they want um, Gaston's voice in, in the park for something. Sometimes they want it uh, in, well, numerous things that, that, that Disney has done where you, you see um, the character come back. Uh, Mickey Mouse uh, 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 Club, what is the name of the, I can't think now. The, the, the House of Mouse? You, the, yeah, House of Mouse, House thank of you. Mouse? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when, when, when Gaston has appeared there, you know, he, he, he comes back every so often. So uh, in, in those ways, uh, uh, it, it's, it seems a natural progression to continue to do other things. But I, I, I'm told that people see uh, a certain um, development in the character <laughs> uh, at, at the end of, uh, you know, when, when he leaves a, uh, the island and, and says that LeFou really was his friend. That's a word that, that uh, Gaston hadn't used before. So, you know, he's, he's, he's growing a little bit in those ways, maybe. Uh, and uh, that's, that's fun to see and hear. But he's still the same guy. He's still the same guy. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. What's your name? Eddie. Um, this is for Paige. Um, what's your best memory of Angela Lansbury? Again, you have another hour? <laughs> Angela Lansbury. Well, I'll, I'll try to make this quick. First time I saw her, I was 17 years old, just got to New York. I snuck in at intermission to see her in Gypsy. And I snuck in several times to see the second act. Back in those days, they would kind of let you do that. <laughs> Wouldn't do that now. So I was, I idolized her. I totally idolized Angela. And then to have the chance to work with her and talk to her about you know, her career and everything was was just unbelievable. But another really cool moment was when we were recording Beauty and the Beast, we were all in the studio with all of the full orchestra. Everybody was live. And Angela was, had been stuck in another city and her flight. She was, wasn't there. She wasn't there. She'd been up all night long when she had to get another flight in and no sleep. Came to the studio and, and Don Hahn said, don't worry, Angela, we can record you tomorrow. I'll go home and get some sleep. And she said, oh, no, I, I think I can do this. I'll be fine and whatever. She gets up in front of the orchestra, no sleep, and sings Beauty and the Beast in one take. And that's the one that you hear. But then another really cool moment, she introduced Richard and I at the Oscars. That was a big one, yeah. And in the wings, I was shaking because you know, we, we sang live, obviously. Some people, they gave you the option to lip sync. I was like, no way, you know, we're Broadway people, I'm not going to lip sync. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, she, she was nervous too. And I said, Angela, are you nervous? She said, Paige, when you get to be my age, you learn when you're supposed to be nervous, this is it. <laughs> and then she like patted me on the back and said, you don't need to be though with that voice. Oh, and then she went out. And of course, when she walked on stage, no nerves, she's grand dame. Lady of the theater, she was like perfection. So I just loved her very much. She and was she was one of the kindest, most generous uh, uh, work, uh, performers that I've ever worked with. Absolutely, she's just magnificent. Everything that you see that that well uh, as the teapot the, that yeah. that motherly um, yeah, Mrs. aura she, is yeah. is uh, she that's her. she's she pours that on top of everybody that's around her. It's, it's really wonderful. And there's a secret that a lot of people don't know about Angela. She had a photographic memory. 
she remembered the name of everybody she met. It was, it was crazy. I mean, people that from 30 years ago would come back to see her and she'd know their name. See, I thought it was just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Great question. Thank you. Okay. What's your name? Hi, my name is Mandy. Um, you kind of already, I guess, briefed a little bit on what I was going to ask, but, uh, and thank you again for sharing the moments that you did about Angela and Howard. I've seen the documentary and it's moving. Um, but it, aside from that, would there be any other actual like key moments from audition processes to when the film finished that you could hone in on and just say that was your favorite? Um, mine was the, the unfinished version at the New York Film Festival, where they showed, showed the, to all the New York critics, you know, and I thought Don Hall was going to have a heart attack. But <laughs> I swear, and Jeffrey Kasselberg was just as bad. They were like, <laughs> but, it, you know, we're New Yorkers. We know what, how tough they can be, you know. Of course, they had a reason to be nervous. And this was the unfinished version. Parts of it would be fully animated. Other parts would be drawings, but it had all of, all of the voice in there. And at the there were line drawings. I, there were, do you some all know what, what she's drawings, talking but, about? And then that, some, that some was finished, but yeah. a lot of it was line drawings. But they, um, they, they applauded after the first number. And then they applauded after each song. And I was like, okay, we got this. We're we good. Got we're, this. <laughs> we're good. We're good. So I calmed down after that, but, but Don and Jeffrey didn't. But at the end of the performance, the entire audience stood up and gave it a 10-minute standing ovation. And I will never forget talking to some of those critics who have you know, criticized my work in the past with the New York Times, the Post, and how much they loved the movie. It was just, for me, it was just like the most amazing thing, because I know they're the best of the best, the creme de la creme of these critics in New York, and uh, the fact they loved the movie was, I think that was one of the most amazing well, nights. Well, we, we all believed that. We, we, yeah. were, we were pretty crazy about it ourselves. And, you know, a along the way, in the process, um, you, you see bits and pieces, and, and uh, as, as the characters, the artists change the look of the characters along the way, and you see how, how that works, and, and uh, they change lines along the way, and they change um, just so many things, and you see um, animation of the line drawings themselves from time to time. My daughter was four when we began this, and so when the, the uh, show uh, had its premiere, uh, in the unfinished version, she was quite familiar with a lot of those line drawings and, and various uh, permutations of, uh, of Gaston, for example. And to watch her face yeah. was, was uh, such an affirmation for me. It's, it's like, it was, I, I've, I was doing a Disney featured, you know, uh, animated feature. I, I, there's something, I don't care how, um, uh, experienced you are, there's something very special about that. We were raised with that. Everybody here, uh, you know, uh, was, was raised with that around, no matter what you may have thought of it. You know, we, we all know what that is. And here I was, I was part of it. And I, my friend was part of it. And, and we were doing this thing and that, we, that Disney was so careful about. They, they, they treat these things uh, like, like scripture or something. It, it, it's so... Um, it's almost a holy endeavor uh, being true to Walt and his, his, uh, his vision of things. And so you knew you were part of something special and that it was going to get very special treatment. And yet, here you are in front of critics for the first time and there's a little bit of... Uh, and I'm watching my daughter. That's and she's right. just... Oh, to see she, her face, that was she amazing. Is, she was just so taken yeah. with it. And I thought, okay, <laughs> all right, I think, you know doesn't really matter if anybody else likes it. We're good. So, so that was a very special moment to me. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Great. We got a few minutes left in our final three questions. Oh. Watch Hi, me. Belle. Hello. <laughs> uh, my name is Katie, and I have always really identified with Belle. I love the character, so uh, I love seeing her come back anytime that that happens. So my question is, uh, what was it like coming back to do Ralph Breaks the Internet and come together with all the other princess voice actors? <laughs> It was a party. <laughs> when they first contacted Michael and I about doing it, we thought that was a joke because they never allowed the princesses to interact in the same story until then. I wasn't even allowed to paint them in the same painting for Disney Fine Art. Uh, so that was a big first, uh, but it was really fun. I mean, we, 
we did record alone on those, but the princesses partied twice. And it was <laughs> so fun for us all to get together and share stories and laugh. And um, it was pretty amazing, actually. It was great. Thank you. All right. You can grab the microphone if it's easier for you. There you go. This is so cute. <laughs> I don't know if I can figure it out. You got it? Yank it up. It'll Perfect. Be. There you, you got go. It. What's your name? Anna. Hi, Anna. What's your question? Why did the beast um, lock the man in the, the jail when he tried to take one rose or two? Why does he lock Maurice? Why did, he, why did they lock Maurice away when he only tried to steal one rose? <laughs> that is a brilliant question. And I'm dumbfounded how to react to it. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it just shows that the beast had a long way to go because he was very selfish. Um, you saw at the very beginning of the movie the really selfish side of that person. And as he grew and Bell brought out the human side of beast, that person later would never have done that. So I think a lot of it is that Bell softened the beast and brought out the, the boy. Because, you know, let's remember, Beast was really just a young man. He wasn't a man yet, really. He was, you know, a teenage man. And roses were very important to him because when the rose loses its last petal. Right. So he, he's He very, knew that when the petal was gone. He knows that roses are special. Yeah. Great question. Thank that you. is a good question. Thank you. I need you. to work on that one. She's... I'll give you a cheat sheet later. Well, <laughs> is there any... My name's Scott. Is Hi, Scott. For Grandpa. Is there any is there any um, line that you added, you know, that wasn't in the script that you added and that they kept? You always hear about these in the. Well, I added one, but they cut it. But Emma Watson used it in the in the live action version. It was uh, after the Beast turns into the Prince, and she's looking at him and touching his face, and she. I said, "Do you think you could grow a beard?" <laughs> and they put it in for Emma. Emma got to put it in. It was great. So. We, we weren't always tied to the exact words on the page because, uh, like I say, in, in, in the process of recording, there was some, some freedom. Uh, I, I was very grateful for that freedom and for the, uh, the chance to sometimes put a ridiculous or, or, or a, a more humorous uh, 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 color on some of those things. But I, I am not one of those people that you hear stories about who uh, ad-libbed. Uh, David was uh, in, David in, Sires. infamous yeah, for, for certain things like, uh, you know, promises you don't intend to keep. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> things like that. that he that made up just, a lot of those lines. Just fell out of him as he, he was did. as he was recording. So you know, he, he, he was brilliant in that way. I I, I was not. <laughs> <laughs> Great question. Well, thank you. Sir, yes, thank phenomenal you. Phenomenal questions, and thank you guys so much. This has been so wonderful. <laughs>